Hi, my name is Jim Leap. I'm co-director of the Center for Ocean Solutions here at Stanford, part of the new Stanford Door School of Sustainability. I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Michelle Tichikolar, who's a research scientist in the Center for Ocean Solutions, and Zach Kane, who's a postdoctoral fellow with us, and who are two of the lead authors of the Blue Food Assessment. Um, we are really thrilled to have a chance to talk with you about blue foods, um, a topic that doesn't often get featured in food summits. Um, we have a series of short presentations, so we hope to, we plan to leave half the time of this session for discussion. So please do be thinking about the questions you want to ask or the arguments you want to pick, um, because, but that's what this session is for. Um, but to tee that up, let's, t let's tell you a little bit about Blue Food and about the work that we've done to help create the scientific foundation for bringing f Blue Foods into discussions about the future of food systems. So most discussions about food systems um, focus on crops and livestock. And anyone who thinks about it for a minute realizes that we simply cannot provide healthy diets to a, a world of 10 billion people if we continue to rely just on crops and livestock. Crops and livestock together account for, take already half of the habitable land on Earth, and 80% of that is to produce the animals, either to, to graze them or to produce the feed that they eat. Um, so this is one of the largest sources of pressure on the planet by any count. It's a big chunk of climate emissions. It's, a, it's the biggest driver by far of biodiversity loss, of deforestation, uh, of water scarcity, and other problems. So clearly we need to find new ways to feed the planet. I don't think I need to tell that to this audience. Um, but what I am saying to you is that as we meet that challenge, we need to look at the possibilities that lie in the water. Blue foods. Um, Blue foods are any foods produced in the water, whether salt water or fresh water, whether animal or plant or algae, whether captured or farmed. So all food produced in the water um, falls under this label. It is an incredibly diverse category. There are more than 2,500 blue foods, species captured in the wild, either from the ocean or from freshwater systems, or species that are farmed. 2,500 species. And that diversity creates huge opportunities to find solutions for every food system problem, to find solutions that offer more sustainable products, products with a lighter climate footprint or a lighter environmental footprint overall, and often at the same time, pr products that offer better nutrition and help us meet the rampant challenges of malnutrition that beset many populations uh, around the world. To start with nutrition, Zach will take you deep uh, into this work, um, but it's important to recognize that blue foods are not certainly not just a source of calories, but also not just a source of protein. We tend to think of fish as protein, but they are rich in micronutrients. To take this one example, this tiny fish, the mola, is raised by fish farmers in Bangladesh along with the carp they sell in the commercial market. This little fish accounts for more than 90% of the vitamin A in the diet in Bangladesh. Right, so a rich source of those kinds of micronutrients as well as, of course, of protein. Blue foods are also important to livelihoods around the world. The FAO estimates some 800 million people derive their livelihoods from blue food production uh, one way or another. And they are often a vital source of livelihoods in some of the poorest communities, uh, especially on coastlines and, and river uh, sides around the world. It's also important to note that some blue food production systems are destructive. Right? So bottom trawling, which draws heavy nets across the bottom of the seafloor, clear cutting everything along the way. Or industrial shrimp farming, which historically has cleared thousands, millions probably, but thousands of hectares of mangroves and other coastal ecosystems to produce shrimp for our market, among others. Um, there are some blue food production technologies that are really damaging and those need to be managed, right? Or in some cases phased out. Um, so there are challenges that have to be addressed to build a sustainable blue food system. But there are many, many opportunities um, to build a system that is both healthy uh, and sustainable. The food we had at lunch is one example. Uh, mussels can in fact have a net benefit to the ecosystems they inhabit and are also very high um, in a variety of nutrients. So this is why we should be paying attention to blue foods. They have important roles to play in every food system around the world. Um, 
But with an eye towards that potential, um, what we embarked upon uh, now four years ago is something we called the Blue Food Assessment, which was a concerted effort to bring science to bear on the roles and challenges of blue foods uh, in food systems. The, the Blue Food Assessment was led by Stanford and the Stockholm Resilience Center at the University of Stockholm in Sweden, um, in partnership with Springer Nature, the publishers of Nature, um, and then with Worldfish, which is part of the CG system, the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, um, and a deep source of insight and blue foods, especially across the developing world. Over the course of the last three years, we have produced through the Blue Food Assessment now seven papers uh, published in Nature and the Nature Journals. Those papers address nutrition, so the nutrition potential of blue foods. Zach was co-led that paper and we'll speak about it in a minute. Environmental performance, climate, Michelle led uh, the climate paper, paper on understanding the demand for blue food in countries around the world, paper on small scale actors, understanding the small scale producers of various kinds who account for most of the blue food that we eat. A paper on justice, which Zach also co-led, um, which looks at inequities in the blue food system, in blue food systems and how they can be addressed. And a synthesis published just last month in Nature, um, which pulls all of that insight together and distills the implications for food system decision makers who are focused on reducing the footprint of their food systems, for example, or addressing challenges like cardiac, uh, heart disease. Now, all of that was science we set in motion three or four years ago with the partners I described, um, but the goal was to provide science that could actually help policymakers begin to make better choices. And so let me just say a word about that. We here at Stanford have worked hand in hand with the Environmental Defense Fund, with WWF, with EAT, uh, which is an activist group in um, Europe, and the World Economic Forum as partners in bringing the insights of this science into policymaking processes. Our first target was the UN Food System Summit. It was held a year and a half ago uh, in New York. Uh, we were engaged in the summit preparatory process from the beginning, so the two years leading up to the summit itself, um, and with those partners, and the scientists who were part of the Blue Food Assessment, bringing blue foods into the heart of discussions about the various aspects of food systems. Um, that led to the creation of a coalition that brought together governments and civil society around it continuing to advance blue foods at a national level and internationally. One result of that is the Global Environment Facility, which may not be familiar to some of you, but which is the biggest single funder in the in sustainability space and environment. Uh, they just went through a $5.5 billion replenishment and blue foods are at the heart of the strategy um, that won that funding. USAID similarly has just re renewed their food security strategy and for the first time given Blue Foods prominence uh, in, in the investments they are setting out to make. Uh, later this year, um, there will be a new television series, a four-part uh, television series, uh, sorry, the, the streaming service to be announced in a month, so I can't tell you, um, but produced, uh, focused on Blue Foods and the role they can play in food systems and stories from around the world about how people are producing and using blue foods. So we're see, seeing the rise of this agenda um, internationally in the policy making circles, but increasingly interest in the private sector and in civil society, just recognizing that there are things here that we need to be able to take advantage of and we need to begin to pay more attention to the roles blue foods um, can play. So let me just, from that, take three things and then I'll turn it over to the real experts, uh, to Zach and Michelle to take you deeper into a couple of these pieces. The first most important insight is that blue foods are food. I, I've said this to colleagues in the ocean space uh, over time and they will often say, no, 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 fish are more, much more than food. Yes, that's also true. But it's important to recognize that they are food and that therefore they are relevant to food system decision makers, not just to fisheries ministries. And it means that if you're a minister of health or a minister of development or a minister of trade, you need to be thinking about how the blue food resources of your country can help you meet the priorities you have for your ministry. And that's a fundamental part uh, of this agenda. The second thing is the point I mentioned at the beginning is that this sector is unbelievably diverse. 2,500 species with an, an, a, a wide variety of production systems gives you many, many opportunities to develop blue food options that are optimal for the, the problems you're trying to meet, for blue food options that can, in some cases, 
meet several objectives at once. So taking better advantage of that diversity, not defaulting to salmon, tuna, shrimp, and whitefish as the things we eat, but looking across those 2,500 species actually opens up many, many um, opportunities. Um, and that's the basic message here, is, is that there is a lot of opportunity here. That is not to gloss over the challenges that lie in some parts of the fishery space and in some parts of the aquaculture space. Those are problems we have to come to grips with. Personally, having worked on those problems for a very long time, I will tell you that what, what is in many ways to me most exciting about the Blue Food Agenda is that we bring a new set of constituencies to bear on actually solving those problems. That if you have health ministers and development ministers realizing that blue foods are important to them, then maybe you have a stronger constituency for better managing those resources in the water. But in any case, there are challenges. Those challenges have to be met. And with that caveat, there is a whole lot of opportunity, and, it, and it's time that we got more thoughtful about what to do with it. So that's what brings us into this conversation. We are very happy to be in a food system or a food uh, conversation. I'm going to turn first to Zach, uh, who, as I mentioned, has led our work on, um, led the Blue Food Assessment work on nutrition and justice, and is a postdoctoral fellow with us. So, Zach, to you. We doing arrow or spacebar? We're using clicker. Oh. No, 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 the, the, the trackpad. Click with the trackpad. Oh, okay. Clearly I know what I'm doing here. All right, so as Jim mentioned, I'm a postdoc at the Center for Ocean Solutions, and I've been focusing the, the, this particular presentation is on nutrition, but I've also worked a lot on environmental justice and a little bit on kind of greenhouse gas emissions associated with the sector. So um, malnutrition, um, you guys probably all know a good bit about this already, um, but Jim mentioned the term malnutrition, and there are kind of two different aspects of malnutrition. Oftentimes, these different aspects of malnutrition co-occur in the same country, in the same province or district or state, and even in the same household. So on one hand, you have undernutrition, which is not getting enough of sufficient calories or kind of major macronutrients, and then on the other side, you have overweight and obesity, which can cause nutrient deficiencies along with cardiovascular disease and things like that. And fish and shellfish and aquatic plants, or blue foods, um, have a role to play in that from a nutritional perspective. Fish tend to be high, I'm just going to use fish because it's up there, in vitamin A, in zinc, in vitamin B12, in iron, and in omega-3, specifically DHA and EPA, those are marine-based omega-3s that are really important for brain health in particular. Um, so you can get them, basically they bioaccumulate up the food chain. Um, so they come from macroalgae and kind of move up. So they're very common in the silhouette that is here, which is in a sardine. But then importantly, row, there we go. A lot of blue foods tend to be dense in a lot of these different nutrients together. So you can think of them kind of as a packet of different kinds of micronutrients, and they tend to be dense in all of them. So now looking more at just the general consumption relative to other animal source proteins. We prefer not to use the term protein, but that's typically how the sector considers it. Um, so fish kind of is, at least on a per capita basis, um, more similar to poultry and pork than it is to beef in terms of per capita consumption around the world. Um, in this country, you know, fish is typically quite expensive. In other countries, it's a much more affordable source of protein. I use in quotation again. So this is actually work coming out of one of the Blue Food Assessment papers led by Roz Naylor. Okay, so this is turning to the work that I helped lead, um, which looked at the different nutrient concentrations of kind of, what was it, seven different micronutrients and how they compare to terrestrial animal source foods. And by and large, if you look across the graph, a lot of the blue foods tend to be much more nutrient rich in specific nutrients, as well as if you look at the average across them, which is how it's ranked top to bottom, with top being the most nutrient rich, blue foods tend to be far more nutrient rich. And basically the darker the shade here, the closer it is to the recommended nutrient intake for, we picked a woman, 
between ages 19 and 50 for each one of those nutrients. Okay, so um, now I'm going to switch a little bit. So we took all of that nutrient data. We also created a very large nutrient database that can be used to pull nutrient data, if any of you are interested in that. So we connected that nutrient database to a really large food systems model that FAO, we collaborated with FAO to do this. And we created basically a look into the future. So this was a modeling approach. I'm not going to get too into the weeds here, but basically all I need you to understand is that there's a business as usual which is basically we keep producing blue foods as we are currently. And then there's kind of a, what we call the high road scenario. So this was actually a scenario set out by FAO that projects a 15 million metric ton increase between now and 2030, which is coming up pretty soon. Um, and that's mostly from innovation in aquaculture, but then also from improving the sustainability of our fisheries, our capture fisheries. And the idea there is that it's a, it's a limit that's reasonable, that we can definitely hit, that still ensures that production is sustainable into the future. And what we see there um, is that by 2030, so this is for the high road scenario, because there's an increase in supply, there's a decrease in prices of blue foods, which has a series of ramifications for increases in blue food consumption around the world. Um, there's going to be a shift away from red meat, poultry, and egg consumption in the global north. It's all represented here via nutrients. Um, and then also if you look at the bottom panel, there'll be a disproportionately high benefit for women um, who will find far more benefits in different nutrients than men in about three times the number of countries around the world. It's kind of a mouthful, that last one. All right, so now I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes honing in on the West Coast. So we haven't done a ton of work on the West Coast, but part of my PhD, University of Washington, I did. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an idea of the sector that we have locally here. Um, so the blue food sector is, on the West Coast at least, if you're talking about recreation, aquaculture, and capture fisheries, the recreational fishery, there are about 20 million individual fish pulled out every year. So this is a not insubstantial amount of food. Um, and there are about six million fisher, fishers going out to take trips to catch those fish every year. But that's a really small drop in the bucket compared with the U.S. It's about 2% of the total amount of fish that are harvested every year in the U.S. The West Coast aquaculture production system is about a $570 million industry, and a lot of that is focused in Washington and a little bit lesser in Oregon. But if any of you have been to Tamales Bay and had oysters, that would be a representation for the local fishery, or local aquaculture, excuse me. And then um, as far as trade, uh, we have a really high reliance on imported seafood, despite the fact that we do produce a lot of our own. That tends to get exported to other countries, and we import almost all of our fish and shellfish, um, and that's basically coming in four different food groups, and it represents over 79 or almost 80% of all seafood consumed is imported in our country. So it's kind of an interesting flip. Um, and then one last thing, as far as our capture fisheries, especially on the west coast, we're considered kind of one of the blue ribbon management systems. A lot of other countries around the world look to what we've been able to do to recover our fisheries, which used to be absolutely collapsed in the 90s. We've rebuilt almost all of them. I think we only have one fish stock or two fish stocks left on the west coast that aren't back to being rebuilt yet. So we're kind of in a, kind of the gold standard, if you want to say that, on the West Coast. It's something to be proud of, for sure. Um, and then, sorry, these stats aren't at the top of my head because I haven't done research directly on this in a bit. So the U.S. West Coast has about, um, or the U.S. generally speaking, consumes about 19 kilograms of fish per year. That number has been going up over time. It dropped a little bit during the pandemic, but if that's, that seems like a lot, it's really not. Um, so the Philippines, for example, is about, I think, 130 kilograms per person per year. So we're talking orders of magnitude more fish consumed in other countries. And about 90% of people, this is coming from the USDA, are not eating enough seafood um, every week. So it's recommended you eat about two servings of seafood per week to get those important micronutrients and fatty acids such as omega-3s. Um, and then I just wanted to finish with a really cool graphic um, from the SF Chronicle that was, I think it was back in 2015. So I just wanted to kind of leave you with some ideas for the different kinds of locally harvested fish species that are sustainably caught, and then some semblance of seasonality. 
A number of these different fish are actually totally affordable and can be sold um, currently at the dock. The price is about the same as chicken for anything um, mackerel on there, rockfish, um, lingcod is more equivalent to the pork, price of pork. And basically what I think we need to start thinking about is how we can use some of these sustainable, nutrient-rich fish to help with areas that are high in food need. So I think that's a really interesting thing to think about for anybody working in the local food system. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. All right. Last, last of the day, I guess. I'm really excited to be with you today, and uh, I apologize that blue foods were not blueberries, <laughs> but uh, proud to be the only animal source food on the program today. Um, and we've heard a lot today already about um, the nutritional aspect or component, the nutrition and health components of our food systems, but I wanted to take us a little bit into the environmental sustainability components of that as well. And, um, Oh, gosh. All right. Um, Jim already went over a few of these statistics, and I am sure that many of them are very familiar to all of you, but um, as you may be aware, our food system is a major contributor to many types of environmental challenges. Uh, first of all, we see that um, food production takes up about 40% of global land use, 70% uh, of global fresh water use. It is the main um, driving cause of biodiversity loss. We also see that um, about a third of direct greenhouse gas emissions derive from our food system. Um, and then the agricultural runoff from land causes, uh, has big implications in our waterways. So we, uh, we see um, f uh, over 400 uh, dead zones around the world. Um, and also we know that many of our fish stocks are actually um, overfished at the moment. So more sustainable management of our food systems is necessary. And before going into the potential environmental benefits of blue foods, I do want to acknowledge that they are also a major, comp or that blue food, blue food systems, like any part of the food system, also uh, contribute to environmental stressors. And this is a, a schematic that came from one of the papers in our blue food assessment that summarizes all of the different ways in which blue foods uh, contribute to environmental pressures on our food system. So if we look at aquaculture, so farming of blue foods, we, uh, most, of the, most of the environmental impacts have to do with pollution of the water. So it can be nutrient pollution or um, anti um, microbial or antibiotics um, pollution or um, other types of, um, there can be fish escapee, so mainly pollution of the waterways. Um, for capture fisheries, Jim already went over some of these environmental stressors, but those particularly pertain to uh, biodiversity impacts, overfishing, um, degradation of the environment, and then what they share um, might be things around uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, and, and um, energy use. Um, but the good news is that um, amid, when we do compare different types of food production systems, uh, many kinds of blue foods actually end up um, produce, uh, performing better than what we see in uh, different types of animal source foods. So this compares for different types of animal source proteins, the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and we see that uh, wild fisheries and aquaculture in yellow are really on the lower end of the spectrum. Um, and I think um, what is really fascinating about this, uh, especially, uh, are, and these are some of the results that came out of the blue food assessment, is that amongst this enormous diversity of species um, that we see, these 2,500 different types of blue food species, there's also a really big diversity in their environmental footprint. And so if we think about the role of blue foods in future food systems, we really need to be able to grapple with this diversity and think about what kind of systems do we want to invest in. So I wanted to share some results from the environmental performance paper of the Blue Food Assessment. Um, and here is two charts that look at the greenhouse gas emissions coming from blue foods. And at the top, you see farmed fish. And at the bottom, you see wild caught fish. And so you see the different species groups. And then um, the blue 
the blue bars are their uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and then in the brown bar for comparison, you see chicken. And so what really stands out here is that, first of all, you can see the enormous diversity between the different um, species. So um, there are some species that um, have much lower greenhouse gas emissions than chicken. So in the farmed environment, that would be bivalves, like the mussels we had for lunch today, as well as seaweeds. Um, from a wild capture environment, that would be things like sardines and anchovies, so generally really low greenhouse gas emissions. But we also see um, species that have much higher greenhouse gas emissions than chicken. So from a wild-caught environment, for instance, that's things that are caught using bottom trawlers like flounders, uh, as well as uh, certain crustaceans like lobsters. So already here we're starting to see that there is enormous um, uh, importance in being really careful about thinking about the different, uh, what species we select. The other thing I would point out from this graph is you see these wide bars um, of, of variability within certain species groups. And that really highlights the enormous um, potential that there exists to improve um, production systems. And um, especially in the, in the wild capture, we see huge ranges of emissions for the same type of production systems. So that means that there's just tremendous opportunity to improve our practices and um, contribute more to uh, an, a sustainable food system. But one thing that often gets forgotten as we talk about um, uh, carbon emissions is that there's all these other ways in which um, food production impacts the environment. And if we're optimizing for just one of them, we might forget that there is all these other environmental impacts that we need to be mindful about as well. So in this study, they also compared the different nutrient emissions for different types of blue food systems, as well as their fresh water and their land use. So as we think about land use, that is mostly, um, or so all of these four are only associated with farmed fish because uh, wild capture fish don't have these impacts associated with them. Um, if we think about land use, that's really mostly associated with the feed that the fish eat. Um, and the same is the case for fresh water. Um, and so as a result, we see that really um, species that are low on the food chain um, are much more efficient than um, ones that take a lot of feed. Um, and once again, just really highlighting the diversity here as well as the complexity of decision making um, in, in such a multi-dimensional um, space. And then here I will um, shamelessly steal one of Zach's graphs, um, which is really helping us pull together these dual dimensions of nutrition and environmental performance. Um, and so what Zach did here was he um, calculated sort of the, the nutrient the nutrient for your greenhouse gas emission buck. So the, the foods that are all the way on the left side of this graph have both low greenhouse gas emissions and high nutrient density. The ones that are on the right hand side of this graph have really high um, greenhouse gas emissions to achieve that same type of nutrient potential. And as you can see, first of all, is that most of the, most of the foods on the left side of this graph are in the color green, meaning that they're plant-based. And I think that's why we have a plant-based food system or food science summit here today. But what is really exciting to, to know is that the only, uh, the only non-plant foods that are on the left side of this graph are uh, blue foods. So we see from, the, um, from capture fisheries, really sardines and anchovies having a lot of nutrient density for your greenhouse gas emission buck. And from the farmed environment, um, bivalves, again, the mussels we had for lunch, and carps perform really well. And then a final thing that I wanted to highlight that I haven't really heard a lot of discussion in today's summit about is the, is the fact that we are also going to, continue to face various challenges as we think about the roles that these healthy foods can play in future food systems. It's really good and well to identify the foods that perform well from a sustainability point of view and that are really nutritious, but what, what is the how are these how are these foods going to perform in a changing climate? And um, when we think about blue food systems, there's really a diversity of climate threats that we are concerned about when thinking about their future performance. So that is, uh, for marine fisheries, we're already starting to see that fish stocks are shifting their location and their productivity. Um, we're starting, for freshwater fisheries, um, 
loss in or changes in rainfall patterns are um, becoming a big issue as well as warming waters. Um, for marine aquaculture, um, as well as for freshwater aquaculture, there's all these connections with the feed that the fish eat that, could, that mean that if there's impacts to crop systems on land, that will have ripple effects into our aquaculture system. And then we're seeing that increasing storms and sea level rise and heat waves are really um, uh, posing a big threat to infrastructure that is supporting all our blue food systems. And I think this is the case for plant-based foods as well, is that we really need to think about how, how these healthy foods and sustainable foods can be adaptive to a changing climate. Um, and just a, a final, final graph to show you here is that these are uh, our projections of where the current uh, benefits of blue food systems are most at risk from a changing climate. So these should really be our priority targets for thinking about climate adaptation uh, in conjunction with increasing access to healthy and sustainable diets. And the final thing I wanted to highlight here today is that um, uh, through the work that we've been doing with the Blue Food Assessment over the last couple of years, we're really starting to create a lot of opportunity for bringing blue foods into uh, a lot of these climate and food discussions. Uh, Jim already highlighted the United um, Nations Food System Summit, and one of the things that came out of that is this Aquatic Blue Food Coalition, which is a multi-stakeholder coalition consisting of governments, intergovernmental organizations, and NGOs, and together we are really working on, on bringing blue foods to these various high-level policy arenas. And uh, most excitingly right now is that COP28, so the climate COP that will take place in the, in the United Arab Emirates this year. Um, there's a lot of noise about it becoming the food COP, um, and food finally getting the central role in climate discussions that they deserve. Um, and we're working hard with our various partners on ensuring that blue foods are really a part of that process. Um, and another exciting thing that we are now building out is that there is a um, UN Decade of Ocean Science um, program that we just established, which is uh, coined Blue Food Futures, uh, and that will be housed here at Stanford, and under that umbrella, we're hoping to continue to build partnerships that can bl bring blue foods into various uh, research policy and action spaces. Um, so with that, I'll leave you, and I look forward to all the blue questions. Zach, you said something about the West Coast and 80% of our food being imported. And, and that we export a lot of our stuff. Why, what's the rationale behind that? Why are we not just having our own domestic sourcing? So, okay, it's working. Um, so the stat was actually US-wide. I probably said that incorrectly. Um, the main, one of the main reasons, well, there's two reasons working in tandem. The first is that we tend to export the really high value fisheries that we have, and a lot of that's going to Japan and to China. And a lot of those species, um, if you ever go buy a, a, a glass case, as we call them, but a fish counter, um, would be things like black cod, um, thorny head rockfish, um, some of our tunas, uh, a lot of kind of the high value things just kind of get pulled away into the markets that are willing to, to purchase them. And then the other component is that we did have a history of over exploitation, as we call it, or overfishing. Um, so with that, a lot of the local supply chains eroded and had to, if they were going to survive, they had to shift to agriculture or, you know, basically processing something other than fish because there wasn't, there was no supply at that point. Um, so a lot of that infrastructure hasn't been rebuilt yet. Um, so that's one thing that will need to change if we're going to try and supply more local fish to local consumers. There's actually a, I didn't mention this during the talk, but I quantified that. Um, each year, we're leaving about 67 million servings of fish in the water in one fishery alone. That's our West Coast ground fish trawl um, that can be sold at about the price of chicken. So there's a lot of fish that can be sustainably harvested, So can, by which I mean they can be caught at a level that biologists have decided can be harvested year after year without negatively impacting the stock. But they just aren't because there's no market. It's kind of one of those chicken and the egg scenarios where Basically, we need to create what's called a pull market to try and create some demand so that the fishers will actually go out and start catching fish again. 
if just add two quick things to that. One is, and we do like several kinds of blue food that are mostly produced elsewhere. So we farm salmon has become very cheap <laughs> and is mostly produced elsewhere. Um, a lot of tuna is, of course, produced elsewhere, shrimp as well. And so those things I mean, skew it. I think the third thing, and I don't know the percentages, but there is a fair amount of seafood caught in North America that is exported to China to be processed and then re-imported to the US. And I don't know what portion of that is, but that's another piece of this puzzle. Uh, yes. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Judy Holm, and thank you for this really um, interesting topic. Uh, my ex-husband was a Norwegian fish guy, so I <laughs> went to a lot of fish conferences over the years. Um, I, I just have a couple of quick questions of clarification on the data. Um, I do have a climate sort of certification through MIT that looks at all bottoms up everything that adds up to where, where we are in terms of our, our climate change. The, the charts and graphs that you use, does that, were those numbers inclusive of the entire scope one, two, three story, for example, right, in terms of the emission on, on all the charts that you, or no. what was, what's included? No, in this so this is just a production side of just things. The, okay. Has anyone done work on the full scope, <laughs> scope of the scopes? Yeah, it's, it, that's, it gets really complicated, obviously, because yeah. the food system yeah. is obviously incredibly complicated, yeah. but there was a paper um, in science um, by the last names are Pura Nemacek, Nemacek, N-E-M-A-C-E-K, um, and they did try and estimate throughout the entire supply chain, okay. which is impressive. <laughs> do, you, do you foresee that becoming part of a purchasing future for food in general? But I, I mean, I, I would certainly, for one, advocate it. Is there a way you think that can be become part of our future. So people know what they're actually spending when they're consuming whatever it may be. Does yeah, that make I, sense? I think um, maybe a little bit that, that might be starting to occur more and more with kind of just thinking about food miles yeah. a little bit and yeah. local food sheds and yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think the quantification is kind of the first step, but right. um, at least with seafood, um, once it crosses international boundaries, it's, which a majority of it clearly does, it gets lumped into these really big aggregated quantities that's very hard to track through yeah. the system to figure out where it finally ends up as like that specific sardine that was caught in Canada or wherever it was caught. Right. Um, but there are people working on it. Jessica Gephardt, who was a, um, an, one of the lead authors of one of the climate papers, has been working on that. Great. So there, there will be more information on kind of tracking seafood through the massive international supply chain coming soon. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Anais. I'm a PhD student here. Um, I was just wondering, more from the consumer side, so we hear a lot about microplastics, and also, like, you mentioned the bioaccumulation and, like, you know, persistent, like, pollutants and heavy metals. So, like, how can we, on one hand, encourage people to eat more blue foods, but on the other hand, there's this increasing, like, pol like the direct pollution pressure that we would be ingesting through this, like, through the consumption? <laughs> Microplastics, I can't speak too much to. We do have someone looking into that like now, um, so we'll be able to speak to that a little bit better in the future. Um, but as far as heavy metals, um, as a consumer, generally speaking, the lower you eat on the supply chain, or the, sorry, the food chain, yeah. I was just talking about supply chains. Um, the lower you eat on the food chain, typically the less bioaccumulation there's gonna be. So if you're eating something like swordfish, you really wanna limit that. Or if you're planning on having a baby, you should not eat swordfish or tilefish while you're pregnant. Um, and it's, but it, it, basically the rule of thumb is that it really depends on kind of the, what we call in ecology, the trophic level or how high up on the food chain it is. And that's basically kind of like the, the main indicator for, for heavy metals at least. But then there also is different, you know, different local, localized waterways, say you're, you know, catching fish in Tijuana River or something like that, where there's really high loads of all different kinds of heavy metals, even the low trophic level fish are gonna have a lot in them, of course, so. Hi, my name is Sally Duplante, and I'm curious what you think about cell-based seafood, the kind that Lou Cooper House is touting. All right. Um, <laughs> So I actually went to a summit um, that was here, I think it was in this room actually, on cell-based foods. And it was, really, it was really interesting to be a part of, to listen to kind of the, the cutting edge of what's coming out. Um, I think you know, if, if you're opposed to you know, the, the killing of animals, 
I think that's going to be a future, but you really have to be able to afford it. Um, it's going to be a long time until the economies of scale make it such that it will be available in a market at even something remotely like whole food prices. Um, it's it's going to be a long time. I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. When do you think it's available? Like 10 years? Are we looking I at I have that? no idea. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just add something to that? And this is just me shamelessly paraphrasing um, what Xiao Kampari said at, uh, when I met him at COP27. He's the food lead at WWF. And his take was that if we look at our food systems today, we're already producing more than enough food to feed everybody. But um, but clearly, that the that nutrition is not reaching people around the world um, equally. And so the idea that we would solve our food system challenges by putting this extremely high-end um, technology on the one hand that like it's not going to at scale increase accessibility to nutritious food for the people around the world who need it. Um, and if I think that is, might be a good guiding star for thinking about where we need to invest for equitable, healthy, and sustainable food systems. Not to say that no one, everyone should feel free to go crazy in the lab to the extent that they feel like they want to, but yeah. Hi, I'm Summer. I'm a PhD student studying food. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so it seems like increasing the demand for seafood is a big challenge ahead of us. What do you think is the number one reason that we are not consuming enough seafood at the moment? So I think there are several reasons. I, I think there's a general feeling that's, that fish is tricky to cook. Mm. There's some cases that it, that it makes your house smell, <laughs> right? That so and there's a and it's complicated, right? I mean that there's just so many things to choose. So it's not. I, one of the things that's so so it's not surprising that in this country I think there are two general patterns. Though maybe Zach can, can say more. Number one, people don't. There aren't very many different different kinds of fish that people cook at home. And number two, they generally actually prefer to eat fish when they go out. So, but I was um, struck by a statistic from a colleague in the retail the wholesale sector in Europe a couple a year or so ago, who said that they, they su supply all the big supermarket chains in Europe and all the big food service companies. They source 25 species of, of blue foods for their supermarkets and 125 for their food service companies, which suggests that food service has a huge role to play in actually introducing us to new blue foods and helping us get comfortable with those foods, right? And to shift away from tuna, shrimp, and Salmon is what we eat. Um, and the, I don't know if there's anyone here from this, the Stanford Food Institute and the Menus of Change User, University Research Collaborative, which was referred to earlier, is to me a super interesting effort to get at that, right? Is to say, how do we take advantage of food service as an entry point for finding ways to encourage people to enjoy the kinds of muscles you had at lunch, right? Which you wouldn't have thought to make at home, I suspect. Thank you. Do you know um, any effort from the culinary sector that's working on like overcoming the, the fishiness or texture or whatever that's not appealing about seafood? Well, the, the Culinary Institute of America is a, is a partner with Stanford and others in this Menus of Change effort. So that's very much focused on how do we create, and it's of course not been focused on blue food. <laughs> That's coming, uh, but but very much focused on how do you make healthier, more sustainable food options appealing to customers, right, or to diners, and and that's is that's about recipes and it's about description, right, as well as about the sort of nature of the underlying ingredients. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing they're trying to get at. Yeah. The one thing that I'd add is that. There, where there is a particularly large gap here is seems to be in the area of seaweed. There seems to be a lot of excitement the world over to massively increase seaweed production, and people seem to have all sorts of ideas about the many things that increased seaweed production is going to solve for us. But the question of how are we in, in Western diets going to incorporate seaweed is, I think, pretty much unsolved so far. <laughs> so... Um, I, yeah, that's why I don't think we had seaweed in our lunch today because it's really not a thing we're very co comfortable cooking with in the U.S. Thank you. Um, that actually is a good segue into my question. Um, have you encountered um, 
other cuisine, cultures and cuisines that use seaweed as sort of like a voluminous primary ingredient? Like, I've seen seaweed sprinkles on things. I've seen, you know, the nori wrappers. Um, but they tend to be these very, and, and like in your miso soup, there may be some kombu. I think that's kombu that's in that. Yeah. A wakami, something, one of those two. Um, but they tend to be like these smaller kind of sprinkles and things. And I haven't really encountered an ocean non-animal food that's like, you can sink your teeth into it kind of. Have you guys encountered that in any of your, your culinary explorations of these options here? The 2,500 edible flu foods, are any of them? Yeah, I think you're onto something. So I think um, I have encountered one, I'll start with that, and that's pickled bull kelp. Um, it's a West Coast delicacy. Um, that'd be bull kelp, so the, the kelp that washes up on the shore, it's, it's really long, it looks kind of like a, like a bull whip or something. Um, people will, if it's really fresh, they'll chop it up and they can pickle it. Um, and that would be the only teeth sinkable texture, I think, that, that you could find. Um, seaweed actually is really high in iodine, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, but I think a big part of why it tends to just be in sprinkled format is because seaweed has to be dried in order to be shelf stable. You don't really want to eat seaweed that's been sitting around or you can't really like freeze seaweed and then thaw it and eat it. Um, actually you can. Green, the kind of like Japanese like mixed seaweed dish that you sometimes get at Japanese restaurants would be the only kind of example I could think of of that. Um, so I think it's a big part of just how you have to store seaweed that makes it more of a sprinkle on item than kind of like a, a beyond meat kind of equivalent. I also think that the food cultures that at least I can think of that incorporate seaweed into their diets tend to be cultures that do have lots of small dishes and not really how we formulate our plate as a, you know, a few items. And so if one of your many small dishes is seaweed, that that, I guess that's a different way of conceptualizing the contribution than trying to like swap out an entire steak with, with seaweed. Um, and there seaweed was some, steak! That's an yeah. <laughs> um, I'm now trying to think of, I, I recently heard some statistics, this is not specific to seaweed, but about the diversity of blue food species that are consumed in different countries. I think it had to do with... Um, was it Hiroi Shiharu who came to visit us, right? And she had, you know, the top the top 40% or something in in the U.S. is four different species, but in Indonesia it's like 17 different species. So the, the um, this, this diversity, the food culture is clearly really important in driving diversity of blue foods and diets. Follow-up question. So, you know, as a physician, I guide my patients on the standard stuff around mercury. Um, I may get into PCBs, but even then I'm not sure. And I'll consult and I'll give uh, examples from like EDF for, because they have the omega-3s and the mercuries. But are we missing other toxins um, just because there's not on the radar, given the contamination of our waterways? And are there practical resources that we can translate to our patients in the exam room? The only thing I can think of is when there's like harmful algal blooms and they're telling people not to fish. But, but I th so I guess that's more of a EPA type decision, but. Yeah, we haven't focused a ton on contaminants with the BFA, so I can't really speak to it other than just, you know, what I've read with respect to mercury. Um, I know their recreational fishing is a huge concern for that because there'll be fishers that go out into, you know, local, particularly urban waterways. Um, but I don't think there's really any tracking out there or there's, I don't, you probably know better than, I'm sure you know better than I do as to kind of what the threshold levels are. We do, we are tracking that kind of data, data on just heavy metals and contaminants and things like that as part of the nutrient database, but it's, it hasn't been a focus yet, and I think that's a big you know, point of need for sure. The one thing to consider there is that um, 
it's much harder to have kind of blanket statements on health um, or health risk in this case because a lot of those are so regionally specific and geographically specific. Like if you're fishing, you know, near Hunter's Point in San Francisco, there could be more issues there than there would be, you know, just 20 miles away, um, even though it's the same waterway. So I think it's, that's a really tricky thing to try and figure out. And then how do you tailor the advice based off of that is a, you can't sample every fish people are eating. But I think that's a really massive question for sure. Is there tracking of PCBs though? Because that is named as a grouping, but I don't know if it's- helpful. I'm not sure off the top of my head. And I, I would imagine it is very sparsely tracked. Um, I know that they do go out and they do track in certain different sites um, the level of contaminants in certain fish species. But interestingly, um, oftentimes that doesn't line up with the areas that people actually fish in. They're just areas that the Department of Fish and Wildlife have always gone to and always sampled. Um, so they might be tracking fish that are either really low or much higher in contaminants than the actual grounds where people are fishing. So setting aside recreational, do you think people should be worried about eating California fish? I think in the open ocean, there's enough oceanographic mixing. So Jim's question if online Sorry, is needed. <laughs> Um, so, so the question was whether or not people should be worried about eating fish that are commercially caught in California that are ending up in local markets. I would say no, um, because a lot of the marine fish that we're catching are caught in the open ocean. So there's a lot of mixing. So contaminant levels are typically low, except for a couple of those species that we talked about already with mercury contamination could be an issue or anything that, um, any toxin or contaminant that accumulates up the food chain that'd be the kind of thing you'd want to watch out for. Um, I've got a, a sustainability question. So production method is going to be a big driver for blue food. Um, what's the biggest areas that you see are going to make impact, particularly with, with farmed or produced um, blue foods, but also with catch foods? Do you see areas or production methods that, that are really exciting? Yeah, so with caught fish, the emissions are really mostly coming from um, fuel use on vessels. So um, make the, which gear you use there uh, makes a big difference. But I think an exciting um, connection there is the fact that if a fishery, fish stocks are well managed, it means that there is higher, um, the, that there is more fish around. And so boats have to spend less time on the water catching the fish. So there's some uh, sort of a really interest or exciting connection between managing your fisheries well and reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from, from those fisheries. Um, on the aquaculture, oh well, and then I would add that there is starting to be um, movement towards electrification of fishing fleets and things like that, but it turns out it takes a really long time to replace um, infrastructure that usually is built to last a couple of decades. Um, so, that, so that's a, a challenge there. From the aquaculture end, um, most of the innovation seems to be around um, feed. So, so uh, currently about 10% um, of fish feed is, a, is fish meal and fish oil. Is that right? And the rest is, uh, is uh, things that are grown on land. And so switching from using soy that comes from deforested areas to not deforestation soy would make a really big impact on, on the greenhouse gas emissions of that feed. Um, there is also some exciting um, things happening in the, in the fish breeding space. So they're, they're um, applying the type of genetic techniques that are already used in, say, uh, in, in livestock um, on, on fish to make them grow faster or make them make better use of the feed, so that will also reduce the emissions. And I think that really highlights one of the tensions around diversity in blue foods, is that the kind of investments that you would make there would really make you focus on like one species. So it'd be really difficult to do that for 700 species um, at the same time. And then there's finally some really exciting opportunities emerging more in circular economies, so really making uh, use of waste streams as inputs in feed for aquaculture. Um, and, and 
especially in the European context, I hear a lot of excitement on circular economy thinking, and hopefully that can can be built out in the aquaculture realm as well. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> Um, just two quick things to add to that. Um, so one is that, uh, so Roz Naylor, who's a professor here and who co-chaired the Blue Food Assessment and is a sort of global expert on aquaculture, published a review of aquaculture science over the last 20 years, a year and a half ago, January of 21, two years ago. Uh, anyway, so in it, what it details is that over the last 20 years, there's actually been a huge amount of progress in, in several parts of the aquaculture sector in reducing footprints, right? In reducing the rely, in, in improving the rate of conversion of feed to, to fish, right? So reducing the reliance on feed, reducing the reliance on fish in feed, um, and so forth. So there, there's a lot in that piece that allows you to see sort of, okay, what is promising and what progress is being made. Um, a big part of it is, as Michelle said, feed, getting feed that, that, um, that has much less impact on the environment, but also yields fish that taste good, because not all feed yields fish that taste good. Um, so anyway, so there's a lot there. And also then progress that has been made in reducing the reliance on inputs, on antibiotics and so forth as, as in intensive fish operations. The second thing is just to highlight the overall point, which is that as, as you've heard from through all these comments, a part of getting to improving sustainability is shifting to systems and species that are just intrinsically more sustainable. And one of the, having been involved in sustainable seafood for a long time, one of the things that strikes me is that we've been very focused on driving best practice into the existing systems, and there have been big gains made that way, but there are even bigger gains to be had from moving from to, to systems that are intrinsically higher potential, right, in terms of uh, greater sustainability and better health outcomes. Uh, so finding ways to diversify is a big part of the sustainability challenge. Um, yeah, hi, thank you for this, this talk. I appreciate the, uh, all the considerations on sustainability and health. I just do want, do want to mention that during this conversation, I do think it's important to acknowledge that we are talking about sentient animals here. Um, and we're looking at, for fish, two trillion being killed a year on estimate. And these are animals that legally and culturally are probably protected the least out of anything or any other animals from um, cruelty and suffering. They're not covered by the Animal Wel Welfare Act. And I think it's just, I just wanted to acknowledge that, that we are talking about sentient animals that feel pain and, and suffer. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I'd like to um, sort of second that as an important comment. I think um, as we think about sustainability of food systems, it's really important to keep pushing the frontier of what sustainability means for us. Um, and, and when I was at COP27 last year, I got to meet some people from an institute called the Aquatic Life Institute, and they're really focused on animal welfare um, practices related to fisheries and aquaculture. Um, I mean, I, there's an overall, I think, question about are you fundamentally okay with eating animals or not, and I, I, like, it, there's, there's um, many different streams of thought around the world there, but it is exciting to me that there are groups of people thinking about how can we improve our production practices, not only with a focus on uh, environmental sustainability, but also um, with a focus on improving animal welfare in the process. And then there's one other thing that I'd like to add there, which is that um, an, another often forgotten dimension of sustainability pertains to the people that work in our food production systems. And um, it's somehow those often even come after when we think about animal welfare. And um, some work at our center also focuses on uh, labor practices in uh, fishery supply chains. And I'm really excited. I think one of the exciting implications of bringing blue foods into these food spaces is this opportunity to really tackle those multiple dimensions of sustainability and really really figure out what that means in an all-encompassing way and not just thinking about, say, carbon emissions. You said something earlier about, you know, this, the salmon and the shrimp at the grocery store. It's like we can kind of get stuck in our patterns. It's like, what are we going to eat tonight? You know, choices are tofu, chicken, shrimp, maybe some chicken sausage. You know, I'm just thinking my local trip to Safeway. Um, 
do you do you all have you know three or four things that might not be on our radar but that we would be able to find if we tried maybe if we went to whole foods like being in california like if i want to be better how can i diversify here and now and t tomorrow at the grocery store or nearby fish market or something so there's a couple of answers. So if you're going to your local market in your local neighborhood, um, canned fish has actually come a really, really, really long way. It is definitely not what it was when I was growing up eating mackerel. Um, it's a high value product now, um, but it's still much more affordable even than chicken. And it's got the nutrient value that you know we showed up in those graphics. So I think Keeping an eye out for canned fish and every once in a while experimenting with it is pretty good. The nice thing about them is that there's really no preparation required. Um, you can just make a noodle dish and just put it on top and if it's a high enough grade olive oil and it's a high enough grade fish, you know, you've got your protein right there and then you just need to find, you know, a big chunk of veggies to put on top of that too. Um, another one um, and something that I really... Uh, encourage is for people to come to a place like Pillar Point Harbor in Half Moon Bay, which is where I live, um, and actually go out onto the docks. And you'd be amazed at the number, the diversity of fish that you can find on the docks. And you can actually talk to a fisherman, see what their life is like, and buy fish directly from them. It's a really, really cool experience. And you'll be able to find you know, local Chinook salmon. Um, you'll be able to find all kinds of rockfish, ling cod, um, sablefish or black cod, all of those are really, really nutrient-rich fish, and most of them are, I mean, definitely cheaper than beef and about the same price as pork. Wow, yum. I look yeah. forward to but doing that. But eat those um, bivalves. That was one thing I forgot. Oh, bivalves? So mussels, oysters, clams, um, Patagonia provisions, actually. So Patagonia has a food arm, and they make some of the highest quality canned fish I've been able to find anywhere in the world. And I've I seek them out. So it's, they're, they're, they've gotten pretty impressive. So that's another one. Yeah. And then I used to be a fishmonger back um, before I got a PhD. So that's why I know about these things. Um, and actually I used to work for a group called Real Good Fish. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so it's a, instead of a community supported agricultural program or a CSA, it's a community supported fishery. So basically you're working to, you're basically paying a subscription and they're doing all the sourcing from local fishers and they basically shorten the supply chain and deliver it to neighborhood drop-off sites. And they are all over the Bay Area. There's another one called Sea Forager um, that's actually run by a local um, person who used to be a commercial fisherman. And he's a really sweet guy. He's my neighbor actually in Half Moon Bay. Um, so there's a, there are some really cool options to have you know, fish and shellfish that you know is sustainable that's coming from local people and supporting the local economy. Thank you, Michelle, okay. for that. <laughs> Any more questions? I see. Yeah, well, we do have one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Malaika. Um, I'm coming from Stanford Earth Systems background and uh, have been working at Impossible Foods for the past few years um, and then left in December back at Stanford now. Um, and I'm really curious, uh, kind of going off of, of her question as well earlier, um, I'd always be asking the R&D team, like, when are we going to focus on some plant-based shrimp or prawns or fish? And I'm wondering kind of what you think of, of that idea as a priority of um, not only encouraging folks to eat lower in the trophic levels, but um, perhaps get off of prawns or salmon or kind of some of these higher GHG emission um, foods and what role you see plant-based uh, mimicry um, in creating a more sustainable food system. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say a word about that. The, the, I think for sure, as with regular, sorry, you're right in the spotlight. <laughs> as with regular, you know, that's, oh, that's much better, thank you. <laughs> as with other kinds, as with terrestrial meats, right, there's, I think plant-based, the exploration of plant-based options is interesting, and, and as with cell-based, right? And I, and I think those will have possibilities in the midterm in, this, in markets like this. I think one of the reasons you see us pressing on the, on the potential of blue foods is that in many, many parts of the world, meeting the challenges of creating healthier and more sustainable food systems, meeting pressing challenges of malnutrition, as well as pressing challenges of, of, of uh, environmental degradation, blue foods will be a really important part of meeting those challenges. And uh, in, in our colleagues report in you know, some parts of the world, 
blue foods, fish are described as rich food for poor people. And, and in many parts of the world, they are a very accessible source of very vitally needed nutrition. So for that broader picture, this kind of, the, the potential of blue foods is super important in our view and from the work that we've done. But for sure, we should be explore, exploring plant-based possibilities as well as cellular possibilities in, in seafood as well as in terrestrial meat. Because number one, as Michelle said, those are interesting, right? I mean, that there's interesting research to be done there, but, but there seems to be some potential. I, just, I don't think it meets that broader challenge on a sort of midterm horizon. If that makes sense. Well, with that, I would love to thank our speakers. It's um, time for us to wrap up for the day. Thank you so much for joining us and enlightening us. And um, I invite you all to join us in the reception by the fireplace lounge out there, um, veering, veering to the left. Thank you. Thank you.